Welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It is Wednesday, March 4th, 2015. Um, not quite Pi Day, but it's coming up to Pi Day, isn't it? Anyway. Um, yeah, so, we have uh, some guests here tonight, who um, a few people who I haven't seen before. Um, I was saying in the pre-show chatter that when EdTech Talk uh, started eight or nine years ago. Um, Jeff Lebo and Dave Cormier just gathered people together and had conversations and uh, saw where it went. And um, I, and this, so I want to kind of consider this uh, throwback to that. Um, Eric Eric Martin um, contacted me and we started to get to know each other a little bit. And he said, you know what? Why don't we do a show about gaming? And I said, well, who would you want to have on the show? And these are the three people he said first. So, um, Eric, do you want to introduce yourself? <laughs> sure. And then introduce your guests here a little bit. Sure. Um, we'll so, let them talk, too. But yeah, go ahead. Right. Um, so I'm Eric Martin. I work in the Office of Educational Technology at the U.S. Department of Ed um, and uh, have been putting together our strategy with the department's first sort of strategy around video games and education um, besides some of the games that we've funded through our small business and innovation programs, grants program. Um, but now we're thinking about ways to really um, build better support for educators who want to use video games in the classroom, build a stronger bridge to the entertainment industry um, because they're the ones who really know how to make fun, engaging, genuinely fun uh, video games. Um, and if they're working with educators, those games can have some really good learning impacts. Um, and so that's me. Uh, with us we have uh, Refrans Davis, um, who is an awesome uh, one educator who spoke at our superintendent summit uh, a couple of months ago at the White House um, and has also been really uh, smart about thinking sort of uh, critically about what is appropriate um, gaming in the classroom and um, what is um, sort of what, what boundaries do we need to be mindful of when we're bringing these games into the classroom and how do we do it effectively. Um, uh, and we have Ontero, who uh, was one of the teacher ambassador fellows who helped lead the White House Game Jam's um, teacher sort of mentoring of the developers who showed up, um, slapping their wrists when they were doing something stupid and coaxing them on when they were doing something cool. Um, and Chad jumped in. Um, to take over for Ontario on the second day of the White House Game Jam um, and is also a magic mastermind, magic the card game, um, and can beat the socks off Ontario and me any day. <laughs> so tell, tell me more, tell us more about the, uh, the Game Jam. Uh, yeah, the so House. the White House Game Jam. Um, this was in September, um, very beginning of September this year. What happened was the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy um, has wanted to do something around video games and education for a while. Um, they had Mark Delora there as their senior advisor to New Media, um, and he's no longer there, but while he was there, his focus was on um, really on bringing video games into White House discussions um, since Obama has, or the president, has made a uh, focus on wanting technology in the classroom that is as engaging as the content that students get outside the classroom. Um, and so what we did was we brought about 100 developers from the entertainment industry and from smaller studios and some educational games developers um, to, uh, to Washington. And they spent a weekend uh, building new educational game prototypes, um, working with educators and students over the weekend, um, students came in and play tested and advised uh, what they were doing. Um, and by the end of the weekend, they presented at the White House. Um, and some of those projects have gone on and are still continuing to be developed. Um, Very cool. So wh why don't we give everybody a chance to introduce themselves? Say a little bit about your your what you're teaching now and what's on your mind and uh, you know who you are. Rafans, do you want to do that for us? Sure, I'll start. Uh, my name is Rafrance Davis, and I am a technology specialist. Um, and what's on my mind right now is 
probably Eric's awesome background behind him. Uh, the, I, it's just it's I I love Harry Potter, so that just really did excite me. But um, but I'm excited to have this conversation, especially since in the last few weeks, I think that I've been very involved with talking about a specific type of game um, that that kind of didn't just hit the market, has actually been around for a few years. So to so just to I guess to really communicate that number one, I love gaming. I love gaming for learning, but I'm really excited to talk about when it's appropriate to do simulations and games and maybe when we need to have different conversations. Say, say more. Um, what, what was the particular game? I mean, Oh, the particular game um, is a historical game. It's a Mission U.S. game um, that where they actually have a great premise to create these historical type simulation activities for kids to do and they earn badges as they play but they also made a, one particular segment on slavery and it was a simulation of a slave <laughs> and, um, and her escape through the Underground Railroad or going back to create the Underground Railroad and it was, I played it, I played it twice, actually three times just so I could capture Vine videos and post them but um, it was just completely disheartening that something like that would even be made and the fact that it had been out for three years and not one person thought to question it. And I've already had a school district in the last week um, hire, or not hire, but bring together an official group of specialists um, of complete and diverse types to say, you know what, we have been using this and we will not be using this anymore. And just to think it's been going on for three years. How long have you been an ed tech specialist? This is year two for me. Okay. Which is funny. Cool. But prior to that, I was I taught high school and math. You're in Texas, right? Just to yes. Do, right? Yeah. Okay. I taught high school math, and I use games in my math class. Uh -huh. um, it be, and they're because they're powerful, and especially when learning complex topics. Kids just they liked the challenge. Uh, but something like this for um, something like slavery, absolutely not. So one of the questions that came up for me is that uh, there's a global kids game called IAT, A Cost of Life, which, which I've used. Um, and it's a simulation game of sorts as well. So I wondered, do you know that game at all? I do not, but mm. I wish I would have known about this prior to now. I would have gone through that process. No, I'm, I mean, I, I don't... I. I have not experienced it. I mean, what you described in that the slaver game is, it was pretty frightening, <laughs> um, I think. But yeah, but I and I haven't experienced the same thing. So so, but you're not. You're saying that there, history and simulation are a great thing, but there's something wrong with this particular manifestation of that. I think that when you ta tackle a topic that is really about oppression of a, pe of a people, um, a conversation that is difficult to have in a classroom to begin with at times. I mean, from my own children and their experiences talking about it, to then not only gamifying it, but you earn badges as you make choices as this young slave. And a, in a lot of those cases, it wasn't as simple as a choice. And the badging of it was just, um, I mean, it wasn't that anything completely and totally heinous was in the game, other than a lot of the historical name calling um, and the beatings, because that had to be there too. But it just, putting my children in that position in a classroom to actually play it and in a class that where the teacher is not necessarily to deal with that content. Mm -hmm. was, um, in a way, was, um, I think it was inappropriate. All right, so I, I think it's fine. You jumped right there, right away here, but let's get some, let's get uh, Chad and Intero in here as well. Chad, do you want right. to introduce yourself and jump in? Yeah, sure. Um, this year I teach technology at the Beta Academy at Shelburne Middle School in Stanton, Virginia. It's a, a program and it's first year of existence, and we uh, serve That's about half of seen. our... No, I'm sorry. I haven't yeah, yeah. seen you. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, I've not, I've not been around much this year. Uh, I've been mostly, you know, on site. Um, 
Yeah, so we serve about we serve half of the eighth grade, and um, our students uh, are with uh, the rest of their peers for an elective period and for math classes, so that uh, no one gets tracked into or out of our program because of whatever math class that they're in. And we have um, two two-hour blocks. And we have a science teacher who works with me uh, in one space. That's kind of a combined shop, breezeway, and computer lab. And then our language arts and civics classes are also held together upstairs and, and co-taught. And we just try to use as much project-based learning uh, and STEM infusion as possible as uh, kind of the means to the end of getting kids to, to feel like they're independent critical thinkers, but also supported by this community that we're trying to build uh, around projects that, that speak to us. I, I'm sorry I don't remember the name of it, but the game that the game for teachers or PD game that you created that I played at a bar a couple of years uh, ago. Yeah. What, how's that going? Uh, we're, well, Ontario can, can speak about this too, but it, it's still out there and under development and has gotten um, sage feedback from, you know, industry <laughs> insiders. And so we'll, we're continuing to kind of tweak the rule set and see if we can't get it out through some other channels for, for people to try. Uh, it's called Learning Alchemy, and just the premise is as you, as you play through this card game, you are kind of on the fly uh, sketching in broad strokes the kind of school at which uh, you might like to work if you were teaching the next generation of adventurers uh, and seeing how different play styles and uh, affinities and student interests play out in different kinds of classrooms through the course of the grade. And so you can have a conversation afterwards about, you know, what kind of school do we make and how possible is it? Is that what we want to be doing or did something go horribly wrong? And your, your building is with Antero? Yes. Okay. Wasn't sure. Yeah, Antero is my welcome. gaming partner in crime these days. <laughs> I'm going to pass the mic to him. Caught it. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Ontario. Uh, I'm currently an assistant professor at Colorado State University, mainly teaching folks who are becoming uh, high school English teachers, middle school English teachers. Um, before that, I was a teacher in Los Angeles before moving to Colorado, um, where it's now much colder and snow needs to be shoveled, and that's a whole other... It's probably a conversation for a different uh, webinar, right? Different conversation. Um, so a lot of the, the stuff I was doing before getting to Colorado was about alternate reality games in my classroom and trying to think through the design principles and what that looks like and the kinds of dispositions that kids get from that. Um, and so I've taken, as if that wasn't nerdy enough, I've, I've taken my current work in a slightly nerdier direction, and so I'm currently doing uh, research on um, tabletop role-playing games like Dungeons & Dragons. Not even like Dungeons & Dragons, just Dungeons & Dragons. Um, so... Today, I, I played Dungeons & Dragons from 3 to 5 uh, with a group behind a comic book store, and it's the nerdiest thing possible, and it's wonderful, and there's such powerful learning happening there, and so I'm trying to um, dive deeper into what that looks like, and it involves um, fighting lizard folk and casting silly spells and things like that, and it's great. Um, and also spending time um, learning with my guru, Eric, around uh, the ways uh, the Department of Education can help funnel some of the conversations needed between um, game design companies, right, and in classrooms, right? So thinking about what Refranz was talking about and really being, really that being powerful about, it took three years for this game to even get this kind of scrutiny is, and there's some real blind spots, blind spots happening. And I, and I wonder if it's, we take for granted that powerful learning happens just because it's a game and that it's, it's good, powerful learning. Um, and so I wonder um, if that's one of the assumptions that's happening with games, right? It's because there's a game and it's made for kids uh, the teacher oversight in some ways um, is being reduced. And so I think um, Eric's been helping the department uh, think through ways to, to bridge those needed conversations. Yeah. And a colleague, Jake Jacobs, is with us as well. Do you want to say hello, Jake? Hi, can, I, can you hear me? Yep. Oh, okay. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, sorry, I just jumped on. Um, I'm, a, I'm an art teacher in the Bronx uh, at a Paul School, New Directions. And um, for, uh, we're a school for uh, overage, undercredited, um, sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. Um, and um, we're uh, we're trying to reach kids through um, arts, and I'm trying to bring a lot more technology on board. Um, but uh, in the arts program, we're uh, we're we're building a a comic book company 
and a animation studio. Um, and it looks like we're going to be producing rap songs too. Um, that's it for right now. But and um, the animation. That's a lot. <laughs> Yeah, the animation studio is in talks right now with a um, a music producer um, from New York and L.A., and he's willing to pay uh, a budget for a, a mu music video to be produced based on the artwork of the of the kids. Cool. Um, <clears throat> and so we we can also create original um, uh, so, uh, you know artwork and and then moving sequences. Um, you know, as, up, up to three minutes, and then uh, the deal will be probably for like a thousand bucks or two thousand bucks or something. Cool. Yeah. Um, so, and, uh, Jake, yeah. I, I just want to get back to the bigger conversation. Um, and and when I when Eric, when you and I talked, we all one of your other passions, and I want you to kind of see if you can make the connection here is raising student voice and and one of the reasons uh, people uh, people uh, <laughs> um, Zach Chase sent you to me is <laughs> is because of the, the work we've done around youth voices and so forth but um, what connections do you see and, and why is that another one of your passions um, and projects and how does that connect with the game sure yeah. um, I think so it's actually a very direct connection um, games are a really great example of a technology that, when used in schools, um, can sometimes be used um, or is frequently used without necessarily uh, having student input about what a good game is and what an effective game is. Um, and a lot of the time, some of the problems you see with a lot of what you see as educational games or games for learning or game-based learning or gamification of learning or any of all of these terms um, is... Uh, a lot of games which are made without sort of the um, qualities that really excite and engage students um, in entertainment games, um, meaning that they either get too much focused on the content without trying to, um, or knowing how to really be fun and engaging and rewarding, um, or they don't have the production quality of those other games, or they're just not, um, they're, they're tedious, or they're, um, they feel too easy and they feel like a waste of time. Um, and when students are allowed to provide input about what kinds of games they want um, and are allowed to provide input into the design of those games too, um, there's tremendous potential to help that Im improve sort of the state of these educational games. Um, so we, and we tried to make sure that that happened too at the White House Game Jam where we brought in um, a bunch of students from a local program in DC called Art Lab, which is a sort of maker space for uh, students all across the district to come in after school um, and just build stuff, including video games. Um, and they provided awesome feedback about what they thought was fun and what they thought was engaging and rewarding and educational. Um, and I think a lot of the times um, when we're you know talking about any educational technology tool, um, if you don't include students in thinking about how that will be implemented in the classroom or what that tool, uh, how that tool feels to the students themselves, um, then you can make assumptions without actually having it based in the real uh, way that the students will use that tool or might not want to use that tool at all. And um, these tools are just a lot more effective when we include them. And games are an awesome example of the extremes of bad tools and really exciting, engaging, fun tools. Um, I, and, and I'm going to hold back now. I want you all to, I mean, I think the jumping around on the, uh, yeah, un, unmute yourselves and, and, and jam here, guys. <laughs> like, <laughs> what's on your mind? What are you thinking about at this point? Chad, I, you want, yeah, go I, ahead. I, I will say I, I definitely agree with Eric. I, when I, I look at my son, I have a 15-year-old son, and, you know, he is, you know, a gamer just like most, a lot of kids his age. And when we talk about the type of games he plays and what if you could create this game, what would it look like? I mean, what, what would your thoughts be? It's really funny that the game he wants to create is one about school. And it's... <laughs> 
And I'm like, what do you mean you want to create a game about school? He goes, you know, I want to examine, like, the culture of school. And he goes, not like the bully game, because that was really more negative. I want to be a student and be able to go in and go into these different cultural spaces and emulate what maybe that idea of schooling would be. He says, I would even like going to class and have maybe having to do a project within the game where you might earn something or maybe there's some consequences, maybe not, but maybe you earn something along the way. And he talks about it all the time. And, and so it just, it, I, I see like the, the stars in his eyes whenever he, whenever he talks about it. And it, you, when I look at him and he talks about school and the way he sees it now, he doesn't, but yet he wants to create a game that emulates that, but not in the sense of what school is to him, but in the sense of maybe his idea of what learning should be entirely. And I think that's very telling. Mm -hmm. I think what's interesting, too, is if you talk to students about the kinds of games that they like outside the classroom, a lot of those games are very um, are hard, frankly. Um, yeah. They are games that you really have to play for in intense with intense focus. You have to learn a lot outside the game. A lot of games actually involve math and strategic planning and critical thinking and teamwork um, in order to actually be successful in the game. Um, and when you look at educational games, a lot of them tend to be quite the opposite. Um, and some of that is just because there's constraints on um, the way we can use games in the classroom, like the time constraints. Um, and bandwidth constraints and those kinds of things, but um, that's something really interesting just about the design approach between these is there tends to be this assumption in educational games that the content has to be easily accessible, um, so that somehow translates into making an easy game, when in reality the best learning happens when there's this challenge and you have to focus and you have to really um, explore, um, and I think there's there's something interesting there about sort of that that difference. Um, Eric, when you said bandwidth, are you talking about like actual digital bandwidth or or people bandwidth? Right. So I was thinking digital bandwidth. Um, I think there's something to be said too about helping teachers be better prepared and um, sure. better supported in using these tools. You want to talk about World of Warcraft for a second? <laughs> um, which which part? Uh, I, I feel like I, you felt like, from what I've seen of you say before, that right. you think it's a, it's a large part of how young people learn or how you learned, I guess. Right. So, um, so I played World of Warcraft in high school uh, religiously. Um, I played. I have over. Uh, Break down religiously. How much did you play? Oh, I so <laughs> this is an embarrassing number. I have over a hundred <laughs> days uh, logged in Azeroth in the World of Warcraft, uh, which means that I have spent that's more days than some kids go to school, right? That's yeah, <laughs> right. Um, I have spent a third of a year of my life in a virtual world, um, so that's a lot. Uh, what and a <laughs> um, and. What's interesting about it to me is that space is where I learned a lot of really, really valuable skills in high school that I felt I was absolutely not getting in my traditional schooling. Um, I became a leader in a guild of um, about 50 core members and about 500 total members joined our guild, um, and it's still active. Um, uh, and through that experience, I learned sort of these leadership skills. I learned a lot about strategic planning, I learned a lot about just um, how uh, how to interact with other people who are just different from yourself, um, which I think school tends to, to not actually provide a really good context for that. We assume that, you know, people say, oh, you have to go to school because um, that's where you'll learn how these social skills and that kind of thing, but we actually don't focus on that stuff a whole lot in school. Um, and in a video game context where you have to lead these people and you have to collaborate with these people. Um, and I got to know my guildmates. I, like, I went to one of their wedding a couple of months ago, um, and they are people I never would have connected with um, in real life because they're just either much older or different political ideologies or all sorts of things. But because we had this game context to work together in, um, all of those things became sort of background information that made... It, it allowed us, the game allowed us to become friends before any of that divided us. Um, 
And I found that really powerful too. So there's all these things that can happen in a game um, that don't necessarily happen so well uh, in in traditional education. And I think there's a lot we can take from that. Do you still play? Sadly, I don't play WoW anymore. I am what they call a filthy casual. Um, <laughs> um, I mostly play mobile games right now, uh, including Hearthstone, which is the World of Warcraft mobile game. Um, and I can sometimes chat to you know some of my guildies there, and we still have our website and um, all of that stuff. So how did this get... It, it sounds like it got integrated with schooling in some way for you. How did that happen? Um, and I use that word carefully, schooling. I know right. learning and schooling. Well, so what happened is uh, one of my fellow guild leaders, um, who is a... He's a librarian up in Boston, and he started a blog about um, sort of library science and gaming and gamification and that kind of thing. And he invited me to come start guest writing on it um, while I was in high school. And uh, I thought that was really cool. So I started doing that you know, at lunch or um, just which, you know, you could never get a student, including myself, to sit down at lunch and write an analytical essay about um, video, like social change through technology, like video games or anything else. Um, taking links and finding out how to source my information and all that kind of thing. Um, by no means was that anywhere attached to my actual educational, like traditional education, and I actually, um, you know, I had to hide the, the computer screen from the librarians because it was a gaming site that I was blogging on. Um, and yet, you know, what he was doing is he, was, he would go back and he would go through and, you know, edit for grammar and edit for um, sort of my arguments and help me think about these things a little harder. Um, and that was incredibly valuable and helpful. And um, he is probably also the sole reason that my spelling is not um, the cause of heart attacks anymore because it used to be like B-O-T-E for boat and um, just terrible, really terrible. Um, and, and he fixed he fixed me. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I think... So that, that mentorship that was, was important. It was, yeah, and it happened because of the game. <clears throat> can I can I ask a question? Go, Jake. Yep. Um, in these, uh, so in these games, um, you know, of, that all you guys are, all you people uh, are experiencing, is is there an a uh, like a graphic interface of like, uh, you know, uh, icons and avatars and is, or, or is it like animation? What's going on in these in these different games visually? Um, well, so um, I guess it depends. I mean, so Chad and Ontario are, were both talking earlier about, um, and maybe they want to jump in and share some of their experience with like analog games, which are games that aren't digital and can have really good educational value. Um, and so those are like Dungeons and Dragons and that kind of thing. Um, World of Warcraft is like a highly digital, virtual, immersive world full of characters and stories and, um, and, and violence and all of the kinds of stuff that is um, scary in an educational setting and also hard to, to include, I think, um, but very, very rich gaming environment. I've been, mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been thinking about the, um, like the games I grew up playing as a kid. When, my, when I was a child... Um, were very much the kind of text-based adventures um, on floppy disks, right? So the way I understood Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy it wasn't as a novel, but it was as a text-based adventure where you had to look under the bed, I think, for the key, um, and you would you would type this in, and it was purely text-based, right? Um, and it's interesting to see that make a resurgence, right? So there, it's easy to construct um, choice-based adventures through that, and young people can make those very easily. Um, there's an online platform that I've been working with a, a school out in LA, CDAGS, um, and they're using, um, it's called Storium, and it's an online storytelling um, platform that was kickstarted over the summer. Uh, and I think they have an education model that's tied to it. But there's some really powerful storytelling that's happening um, through that. And then I guess the extension of that, I recently went to an escape room recently. This is a new genre. Have any of you been to an escape game room? I don't know what the right name of it is. Um, 
it's basically the equivalent of a text-based adventure, but you and five of your friends are locked in a room for an hour, a physical room, a real room, um, and you have to look under the couch for the clue, and you have to find the combination to open the safe <laughs> to find the thing, uh, and you essentially have to figure out a way to get out of the room in an hour. And there's this, it's this whole genre of games that's kind of popping up uh, across cities right now, and I think it's, it's interesting the kinds of literacies that emerge from that, but it's really based on old school gaming to me in some ways. It was, it was invigorating, it was very frustrating. I'm not very good at it, but I, I had fun for the hour while we, while we failed. <laughs> was it something that was, was it like not an education context? It was just like a, a game for friends or? Yeah, it's just a, hey, hang out with friends for an hour. And In a locked get... room. <laughs> it sounds very creepy, yeah. Hey, we're gonna pay this person. That's beyond uh, creepy. <laughs> did, did you find, I don't understand, Inter, did you find the key or not? <laughs> so ours was a scenario where someone was kidnapped and we had to figure out the combination to find and rescue them. Um, so you go into this very nondescript room and immediately one person starts taking all of the pictures off the walls to find the clues behind them. One person's like taking apart the lamp to see if something's hidden in there. At one point we had we turned off all the lights and we had a black light to find clues that were hidden on a map. Um, oh, and it's very much, you know, like a, a scavenger hunt type of a thing that you um, you work with a group. There's a there's a clock counting down, so there's a sense of, of intensity, and so people are like try the blue wire, don't cut the blue wire, right? So it's a I felt very it felt like an, uh, an hour in the life of Jack Bauer or something. I don't know, um, but it was it was exciting. It was fun, and I actually went with a group of librarians um, because they were trying to adapt this model for um, tweens, right? So the um, like eight to twelve year old students uh, that come to their library. But see, this kind of gaming is the opposite of the gaming that happens in the academic setting. This yep. does not happen in school, and the closest that we're getting to that is Minecraft as a class. Mm -hmm. Other than, and even still, in a lot of places, it's not even the higher level, really complex thinking that you can do with Minecraft. It is build a building and find the surface area and volume. When there's so much more that, that kids can do with it. I would like to see some of this type of interaction in, in terms of gaming in school. Maybe not World of Warcraft, but, but the kind that really have to challenge kids to collaborate and, and to work with kids who you wouldn't normally work with on, on a regular basis and to really challenge some thinking in that way, but we don't see that. Totally agree. Chad, can you talk a little bit about, I mean, have you thought at your new school? Um, how gaming is coming in or not coming in? Or... Yeah, um, it's all interconnected for me to, to some work that Ontario and I have been doing as well. Can I talk about that, Ontario? Am I allowed to, to speak of our... Okay, good, the thumbs up, great. So we're making news oh. right now? Okay, good. Well, Ontario and I have been doing some thinking and, and writing together about helping ourselves and sharing with others maybe how we've habituated ourselves to look at games as inspiration for different kinds of teaching and learning, and uh, looking at games as systems and as a series of decision points that can be structured differently depending on tropes and genre. And, you know, how do you get, how did we, you know, get to the point where playing Dungeons & Dragons or Minecraft or going to a game store, or walking past the toy aisle in Target. How do we get to the point where we look at a box, look at the back, get a handle on some of the mechanics, and then think about, oh, we should try this with these kids and that concept. Uh, and we really wanted to, to surface some of that. And Ontario should jump in if I'm botching the description. No, keep going. You're doing great. But, thank you, thank you. Can you break but, the um, down? Either of you break the, the... How did you become habituated? Um... Yeah. What's that word mean? So I know I have it. <laughs> you know, I think many teachers can relate to this, right? And and I do this all the time. Whatever I encounter in the outside world uh, always makes me think of school. So it's that process of living school that makes me see the world through a very school-like lens. And all the criticisms I have about school and all the things I appreciate about school, that's how I tend to see everything. But I've also been gaming for about as long as I've been in school as a student and teacher. And so it's looking at what's in the real world, looking at what's in you know, the real school. Not to say school isn't, isn't very real and immediate when we're there. Um, and to kind of bridge those two worlds with games and game mechanics and possibilities for learning and teaching differently 
and for taking things that are game mechanics but could just be great pedagogies or ways to talk with one another or relate to one another and trying them out and testing them, seeing which ones work with which audiences and which content, and just like every teacher does with a lesson that bombs. You know, shelve it, salvage it for parts, and move on to the next thing. Yeah. Um, but games are uh, purposefully and intentionally a frequent part of that. Yeah, for me, I, I really, when I was in L.A., we, we would have board game nights, right? And it was just friends and beer and pizza, right? And it was just um, a way to, to hang out with friends and, and socialize around games, right? And I think that's that's something I think that's oftentimes limited in, in what we expect to happen in, with school games, thinking about where, Fra where Franz was saying a second ago, um, that games should be a space to, to bring people together, right? It's like the dinner table. And Alice Waters talks about that, that this table is where people come together and they're able to socialize. Um, and so just recognizing that experience for me, um, a, a friend Peter and I, when we were teaching together in L.A., we just started a gaming club after school, and we brought in a couple board games. Um, and after school, kids would come in, um, and we would we would destroy them at Connect Four. That was that was basically it was basically an ego stroke for me. It was just to make sure I beat kids at Connect Four. Um, but then we started bringing in other games as well. And at one point we had groups playing Pandemic, right, and trying to save the world. It's a cooperative game where everyone either wins or loses together. And so you'd have kids yelling, "No, we can't! We can't just disregard Bangladesh. We got to get back to the CDC." And you'd see people yelling around games. And then it would move towards Settlers of Catan, and again, you know much nerdier games, and, and, and as a result, I think kids, the, the, those nerdier kind of Euro-style games really got kids um, immersed in the storytelling aspects of the game, so they would imagine what, I, I heard students give speeches to each other, as the fellow Catanians, and, and here's what we're going to do on this island, and it, it wasn't a part of the rule set, but it just happened, um, and I think those were just the kinds of opportunities that made me realize um, as Chad was saying, like, hey, all this stuff that's happening outside of school, ultimately stuff I, I started thinking about in my classroom, too. Um, can I ask, so um, I, I think I missed the very beginning, but are we all in the classroom with kids? And um, for those of us that are, like, uh, teaching gaming um, in, in different ways, um, it, uh, what, what are the kind of skills that the kids are getting? You know, like uh, as far as create creating the games, uh, is, is there any game creation like handiwork going on in the classroom? Like, you know, how to do the graphics and how to, uh, you know, um, use the interfaces that that create game. I think that'll be a part of our work mm, within the next month to six weeks. That's that's part of what we're gonna do to close out the year. Um, to get things kind of talking with each other, probably through Scratch, but then also with attention to controls and inputs and coding interfaces and makey making and stuff like that. Um, up until this point, can you this can you year, say a little more about what what you're going to do in Scratch? How, yeah, how so I think I'm going to help. Uh, I'd like to help students figure out what it is they're interested in making. You know, like a, a game about school would be fantastic, but you know, if you could make an animation, an interactive story, a game, or a game-like environment, what would you want to do? And then draw on the kind of universal coding concepts that we've worked with across a couple different platforms and get it working in Scratch, but then go out into the web and create, you know, web-native, maybe pixel art and sprite sheets and web-native sounds that we can post on maybe SoundCloud or something like that and then bring those assets also back into Scratch and then create some kind of, uh, maybe we'll run it on a little computer. I guess since it's on Scratch, we could do it maybe from borrow some netbooks or something from another class and build around them cardboard, I guess arcade cabinets would be a way to think of it, that are intermediated with a makey-makey connected to buttons. So a makey-makey sits between your computer uh, your hands, it sits between your hands and your computer, and you can wire it up to anything conductive, and so long as you are also touching kind of the ground wire, the earth wire, you know, whether you make a Play-Doh button or draw a graphite button, uh, whatever it is that's conductive, so long as it's connected to the makey-makey, the makey-makey will pass on your taps to the computer as if you're hitting keys. So we'll think about design and accessibility in the physical surrounding of the game as well as the... Uh, the code inside of it and the digital so you, art so you, inside of it. So you can live navigate the the world that the virtual world that the that the user is in while they're playing the yeah. game. 
Yeah, it's the same as a keyboard. The, the Makey Makey lets you, you know, proxy out your keyboard for you know, the famous examples like, you know, four bananas for up, down, left, right, or whatever. <clears throat> So uh, I'm I'm not much of a gamer, but I'm listening very closely to what you guys are saying. Uh, can the game master change the rules of everything while the people are playing the game and just totally mess with them? And something. Well, there are some games that are devoted to that, <laughs> but not every game. Yeah. Um, it reminds me of like Paranoia. The the. But, but let's hear, let's hear everybody on on like I was I was um, kind of wondering the first part of what you just said there, Jake um, and Eric. I, I I wanted to kind of think if you were a kid in my class, how I would be able to nurture what you're doing right in some way without co-opting it. And so, I don't know what I. But also, you know, there are other kids who aren't gamers, right? And how do you? Right. So yeah, I would I would um uh tweak that a little bit to say um, mm -hmm. certainly there are students who aren't digital gamers of a certain genre or a certain type. I think all kids like to play. Um, mm -hmm. Play is a very natural and important thing for all kids. Um, and finding the right ways to let them play. Um, is really important, and if games of different types can fill that need, I think it's more important. It's important for teachers to focus on diversity. I think uh, who was it? It was Tyga in the the chat um, brought up the point that some of her students um, didn't take to um, the Minecraft experience she was using. Um, some of them really took to it because it was this awesome, deep experience that they could sort of build stuff and. Um, be creative in that sense, but the others who weren't so familiar with it or maybe weren't, didn't have as much of that builder mindset and maybe wanted to do something a little bit different, um, you know, it wasn't the game for them. And I think it's important to recognize that not every game is for every student. Um, and But play is really important for all students and making sure that that's sort of what we're talking about um, and a diversity of experiences available to educators um, to engage their students um, versus, you know, Minecraft for every class or Minecraft's great, but I want, I want, I want teachers to have options, right? Um, so students have options. Um, that was a really clear answer for me. <laughs> that's, that's how finding ways to play, and and I've been writing down some of the words like alternate reality games, uh, simulations, uh, analog games, uh, and it. Goes on and on, right? I mean, is is that what you mean by genres? Um, I guess that's something that Chad, you you've said genres, those different kinds of games. So, yeah, I mean, I you no, can answer, ahead. Eric. Go ahead. No, <laughs> um, there's you know there's everything from first person shooters, which aren't necessarily all violent, mm -hmm. um, to role playing games, which um, like we're friends and maybe we want to talk about this a little bit more too, um, are a very um, delicate genre because there can be a lot of danger of maybe making things um, or, or taking a, a context and trivializing it if you're trying to capture the story and put the player in that other person's shoes, which a role-playing game does. There's massively multiplayer online games, there's puzzle games and platformer games. Um, and a lot of these intersect and can be combinations of different types. Um, and there's genres of analog, non-digital games, too. Um, so, and some of those are games where the player is the creator. Um, some of those are games where um, the player is doing something that's more about story. And some of those are more about building something science-y, like Minecraft can often is you know great for an engineering kind of student. Um, not always great for... Uh, more um, story building kind of student. It depends how it's used. It can be used really well for that. Um, but I think um, inherently the game is more about building um, and collaborating. Um, but anyone can maybe tell me a really great example of that not being the case. Um, but yeah, I think I think there's just a lot of different options there. <clears throat> and um, what about what, what about actually um, some of these? Uh, skills that you get in the classroom converting into 
jobs or small businesses where you where you're gaming and um you know the w what about the the business side of it is this is this actually a viable option for the kids that you teach to work in these fields and get paid um well I'll let the teachers answer that one <laughs> I'm not a teacher <laughs> you know I, I I think that we've kind of taken this whole idea of gaming and gamification and all of the different words that we call it and we've made it into something completely different in the classroom than what this entire conversation is. Um, you know, especially when you look at, you know, I go to a lot of conferences and I think I go vendor to vendor to vendor to vendor and almost every single game, especially concerning math, is more or less about getting to the basic, it's just decorated worksheets is pretty much what it is. You wrap the worksheets in a bow, put some digital pictures behind it and some buttons and say go. And and that's not that that's not conducive. I mean, I wouldn't pay money for that anyway. Um, but then you talk about something like role playing and simulation and you know, I I think about myself and my kids. I remember playing the James Bond game of all games. I did, before I even watched the movie, I played the game um, where you get to be James Bond and you have to really problem solve unless you have like the walkthrough guide um, and figure out exactly how to get through all of those levels and worlds. Um, and then you get to something like, I'm going to bring it back to the simulation, the historical simulation game, especially something like um, slavery. I think the other ones have to do with a young um, Cherokee Indian and then there's another one that has to do with um, immigration which you know immigration is very real to a lot of kids but now it's a simulation activity based on history um, mm. and and it becomes something that isn't necessarily as realistic as maybe the makers of those games wanted it to be it's more of a joke of that time and place and not really a, 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 a great example and um, it's it's also something like that is almost nearly impossible to capture. When I'm playing James Bond, it's a fictional character, and every bit of it is fictional. Um, playing a fictional character in, in something as serious as, well, I don't want to say serious as, well, it really is, but something like um, the, 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 other, the, the slave simulation game, um, it's just, to me, as ineffective as the decorated worksheets. And a little bit offensive. <laughs> they they have they really have slavery games. <laughs> yeah, we'll give you the link to refer. Yeah, her her writing about uh, that. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, go ahead. No, I was gonna say. I, I, mean, I wanted to hear. I, I, I sort of wanted to hear Antero and um and Chad talk a little more about the the writing that you're doing together around all this because it sounds like. Somebody like somebody like the two of you, as you said, you've been habituated to games yourself, right? So it's and and you're a teacher, so you kind of it, it happens kind of naturally to you. It sounds to me like your article is about how how teachers might open up to using games in a playful, thoughtful way in the classroom. Is that Chad? You want you want to start us off? <laughs> Yeah, no, I think I think you're you're right there, Paul. Um, it'll probably amount to uh, a, a hefty thing, but it is about breaking down. I, I don't even know how to call them. I guess I'd call them genres that are out there right now. You know, there are social competitive games. One of the ones we talk about is werewolf and social collaborative games like Pandemic, and we just try to talk about what are the key mechanics. Um, what might they offer different content areas and what are some really concrete steps you can try from you know step one just playing some of these games to step I don't know three or four right trying out one of the mechanics in your room to getting students to design things in these these genres and tropes later on um, and just surfacing as much as we can in really straightforward language um, what it is we, we take from these things as, as educators and we see in them yeah, I think I think part of it is that change from one. I think I think Chad's right, and I think it's not just about getting teachers to play games, but also think having them trying to change the model of. So I guess some background for me: I spent a lot of time in really crappy professional development when I was a teacher. Um, 
So it was that kind of two-hour after-school purgatory once a week that just felt like a waste of everybody's time when you could be... Um, and maybe that's just an indictment of one, one school in one district in the country, right? It's probably, I was probably the outlier there. Um, but I think, I think because of that, we're trying to think through how can, how can teachers make games and, and rethink what uh, the opportunities in the teaching profession could be? Um, but also coming back to something that Eric was saying earlier and Refrain's kind of brought it back too, um, that there, I, I think we continue to search for that magic bullet in education, and some people think gaming's going to fix it for everybody, and we need to recognize that there's definitely going to be kids who certain types of games and certain types of gameplay aren't going to fly. And so, and that's going to be the same with teachers as well, and I think what Chad and I have been trying to think through is what are the different genres of games? Um, and so, like, for example, I have, a, I have a group of teachers in L.A., and they started one of their PD just playing Jenga, right? Uh, and, and I think it was just such a simple shift from what they expected to happen in that meeting, that it, it started a different kind of conversation. Um, but then they also started hacking their Jenga set, right? So if you, depending on the brick you pulled, it had a prompt for something you had to do, um, or some kind of design challenge for the rest of the game, right? And it really allowed teachers to then think through, how can they hack other games, right? What happens when you hack Monopoly, which I think Chad's done some writing around and I've used with teachers as well. Um, I was just going to throw out, um, mm -hmm. I feel like we have, a, we have a suffix problem with games in schools. Um, in that sometimes we talk about gaming, sometimes we talk about gameplay, sometimes we talk about gamification, um, and they're all problematic in different ways, uh, and they're all taken up in different kinds of ways, and there's people who make lots of money on different aspects of each of those, and so I don't, I'm curious if other people um, have thoughts on any, any of those types of words, or if it doesn't matter. Um, maybe Refrans wants to say something, but I totally, 100% agree that, like, Game-based learning, gamification, game... Um... Game of Thrones? Is that the... Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, game I'm full design. That right, I don't think it's necessarily a problem. I think, I, though I do think the sort of what Refrain hinted at, the gamification co-opted intuitiveness of, you know, businesses have been taking gamification and turning it into a marketing schema and, and all of that kind of thing. Um, where you can just slap it on top of educational content and claim that it's going to be engaging and powerful. Um, that's that's a sort of, like, I dislike games being sort of used in that way, if that makes sense. Um, like, it, it feels disingenuous to what games are. Um, it often feels like uh, a contrived version of what's really great and powerful about games to take the most simplistic parts of games and slap it on top of something that sucks um, just to be able to sell it to someone. Um, so. Well, what, what happens is, especially with um, a lot of standards-based grading, is that we've built this, and I'm glad that we have looked at kind of how we give kids chances to master items, and what has happened is we've now taken this idea of gamification and we call it leveling up. So instead of really calling it what it is, you're giving kids a chance to master items, we've now attached these buzzwords onto it, and oh, we're going to give them a badge for doing it. When what's really happening is that basic level of you're just giving them an opportunity to master whatever the content is that's being mastered. And I'm not against, and I know that I've, I've heard all the arguments that you've put, I've I've played Madden for hours just just in order to 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 earn whatever you earn in the Madden game. Um, my son would kill me for that. This is why he doesn't let me play it. Um, or you know, or I think of myself spending hours. I'm not kidding, playing um, Guitar Hero because I wanted to win and I wanted to be an expert. But um, but. But for me, it's been communicating that idea that whether you do it with a badge or a level up, if you make the content engaging um, and the kids are, are, are really owning the purpose and what they're doing, you don't have to attach the fancy names to it. Um, what I would like to see happen is these worlds that we've talked about tonight, that should be what gaming and education is about and not just attaching a badge on top of, in place of a grade. Uh, so much of what Rufranz has said tonight has really struck a chord to me, uh, with me. The, the kinds of apps and schemes that she's talking about are, are really just there to incentivize what are kind of traditional academic behaviors in the school system that, that we have. 
and the behaviors, not in like gaming, which is its own uh, can of worms and needs a lot of attention as a culture, but in the best of games or the best of play, you know, we're giving ourselves opportunities to think about how things could be different in another system and how we can make decisions in those systems. Maybe it's who we are, maybe it's who we aspire to be, and maybe it's who we aspire to be in service to others. And intentionally and purposefully adopting mechanics and games, inventing them, or asking kids to invent them, I think should be a real goal here. Um, not to necessarily, you know, use the thing that comes with this or that or the other thing that's called this, but to think critically about you know, who we are, who our students are, and whether or not play can get us to where we need to grow or a particular game or a particular mechanic. That's the, um, you know, so to speak, that's the end game for me of, of play and professional practice. Yeah, I think that feels so different, right, from what from our friends are saying in terms of, like, there, there's a clear just fundamental binary between play and work, right? And when we talk about gamification in some ways, it, it tries to make play work, and those it just doesn't doesn't work. Right? I've talked myself into a corner. I'm gonna I'm gonna put myself on mute until someone fixes it. Mm. <clears throat> well, uh, I, I think that school uh, is you know uh, what are we what are we doing? We're supposed to be preparing kids for work, and um, you know play is also practice you know for life. So. Um, you know, the question is, can we balance out the the standards and, and, you know, what the administrators are looking for and all the data that everyone has to see, and then, the, you know, the, to the value of time spent in a gaming world where, um, you know, it's it might be hard to show exactly what was what was going on, but, you know, the, the virtual experience that the kid uh, was was going through could be historical fiction or it could be, um, you know, uh, connecting in real time with real people, you know, which is intense in, in so many ways. Um, and then, uh, you know, also learning, you know, if, if uh, like, our kids had this Egyptian setup where they went through these screens and you're supposed to, like, remove the organs of a cadaver so that they could be mummified, and, um, you know, there's like a little test uh, module at the end. And, uh, you know, it worked. And, it, it, you know, it was good. It was kind of like bells and whistles at first. But, you know, then they find, like, you know, the limitations of, like, every screen, you know, by pre you know, pressing every possible combination. So, you know, as, as well designed as they are, you know, that's how in engaging they are. And I, before you guys were talking about the content, um, I mean, yeah, it could be really bogus if it's just slapped together. So, you know, I agree with what you guys are saying. Um, you know, I, I, I was hoping um, to, uh, you know, be able to offer my kids, you know, some year, um, you know, the ability to game. And uh, I know Paul has introduced Scratch to them. Um, but, uh, you know, the in you know, growing up in New York City, the possibilities are, you know, that you could, start a great business, you know. I, I wanted to um, leave a little time here, and we're kind of out of time, but Eric, for, for you to talk about South by Southwest and what you're, you're doing this weekend, just to get a sense of, you know, sure. projection here. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and one quick thing that might tie all of this a little into some of the um, educational realities a little bit better. Um, there's a great group called Glass Lab out in San Francisco that was born out of electronic arts um, that's taking entertainment video games like SimCity um, and uh, looking at ways to use it as sort of um, as assessment um, and of, of student learning. Um, so a student is faced with a like environmental catastrophe in the game um, and they have to solve it because they're playing SimCity and it's the same sort of scenarios they would get in the entertainment version. Um, and the game is tracking sort of the decisions that they make and what information they're using to make those decisions um, and what strategic choices they're making at what points. Um, and the game actually can capture this really rich, um, valuable data about how they're approaching these decisions. Um, 
And if that's you know parsed apart and communicated well to the educator, it can be really really useful to um, to to convey the kind of learning that can happen in these games. Um, so that's a really cool group to check out. Um, Austin, we're doing a game jam um, around uh, sort of our idea after the White House game jam was we wanted to take the effort of engaging the entertainment industry in education by actually going to the entertainment industry and Austin is a hub, one of the hubs of the games industry in the US, the others being LA, San Francisco and Seattle um, and we'll be bringing about 60 or so developers and a handful of educators together um, to spend the weekend building new video game prototypes for education. We also have um, some other events um, that are not yet announced publicly, um, but we are planning a way to, to keep the video games and education uh, wheel turning. Ooh, that sounds fun. Uh, thank you so much for reminding us of this important uh, area of, of thought and, and habituation that you guys want to push us toward. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, quick last thoughts, though, as we go around, and thank you for, for coming around. And Taro, any last thoughts here as we go out? Uh, I'm just really appreciative of the awesome conversation, so thanks for putting it together, Paul. Uh, I, I would just throw, I think, as a, as a nascent genre of, of video games and bringing games into schools, we've got a lot of work to do, and our friends helped us think about that just to start off the conversation, and it's, it's definitely staying with me now, right? So thinking about how do issues of race, class, gender, and our histories with them affect how games fit into our classrooms. So that's definitely going to stick with me today. Mm. Chad. Uh, I, I called on you, Chad. We, you didn't... I was muted, you Andy. You got to give me the sign. <laughs> uh, I'd echo what Antero said, and one of the things that I'd like to think about going forward... Um, this, this alludes to something Eric said as well uh, about games lending themselves for particular kind of content areas or areas of study and inquiry. Uh, how do we get better at humanities systems, humanities games, humanities play? Hi, That's Mom. like meaningful. Um, kids can access and engage in and direct themselves uh, with some support or with some tools. That is, I guess I want to say something like, you know, it, it, it fits where they are and it offers them a chance to think about things that school doesn't normally ask them to think about in ways that support them and help them figure out who it is they want to be. I think that's an underdeveloped area. Yeah. Jake, any last thoughts, quickly? <clears throat> uh, really, really interesting stuff. Um, you know, it's about uh, you know building a hive mind and doing it, you know, in a good direction. Um, they just announced in New York City, which is pretty big. I think we're the first big city in the U.S. to announce uh, bring your own device policy into New York City classrooms. Um, you know, depending on if the school you know agrees internally to do that. So. Um, you know, you could see, you know, uh, kids trying to, uh, you know, uh, play a game on school time. And, um, you know, if they were actually building them, then they might be happy with that. They might be very content and engaged. So, um, yeah. you know, this liter literally just started, so we'll see. But um, for, really interesting stuff. Thanks for joining us. Rafans, you, you, uh, Rafans sorry. you get the last thought here tonight. You know, um, I, I have to think back to a few years back. I was leaving school when I was back in Grand Prairie, Texas, and two boys who were completely quiet in every single class they've ever been in were outside just making all kinds of ruckus, playing magic. So when so who I don't know who it was that mentioned magic earlier, it just really reminded me of that. And then I think about um, one of my other students who's now a college student. He's a junior and still buys Pokemon cards and has Pokemon tournaments on campus, which I think is awesome. Um, and I think that what we have to take away from that is there's something about those games, and those were both very non-digital experiences. There's something about those games that draws these kids in um, to the the mind-boggling problem-solving that they have to do in order to be successful at them. 
and I think we need to look at that. And you, we didn't really talk a lot about student voice, but but getting them involved with the type of learning, like what is it about it that keeps you spending every single dime you have, but staying up all hours of the night just to um, just to accomplish whatever your goals were at the beginning when you played it and embed that in school. And it's not about just attaching badges on a superficial thing. It's about the very deep connection and thinking that goes along with it. And I think that's a that's a powerful thought and something that we definitely have to be mindful of. Well, thank you. Um, I, I want to steal the last half a second here just to thank you all for this conversation. Next week is, I think, um, if Karen is around, I'm not sure, but Karen Fassenbauer has helped me put together um, and invited some folks to talk about um, Open Education Week. Um, the Ian O'Brien, Verna Roberts, R uh, Rhonda Jensen, Joe Dillon, and others, um, Chris Christina Cantrell, um, to come talk about um, Open Education Week, which is the March 9th through the 13th. Um, and we'll put out some notices about that. So that's, that's what we're um, talking about next week. And um, thank you all. We're here every Wednesday. Uh, we've been doing this uh, quite a while. And um, we, are, we broadcast over the EdTech Talk channel of the World Bridges Network that Dave Cormier and Jeff Lebo set up. Thank you all, and uh, good evening. Oh, you're the best. Thanks, Paul. Thanks. See you. See ya. Bye.